The seventh step in the U.S. Secret Service operational guide is create and promote safe school climates. Welcome back. I'm Kyle Anderson. And I'm Holly Hollingsworth. A crucial component of preventing targeted violence at schools relies on developing positive school climates. A positive school climate is built on a culture of safety, respect, trust, and social and emotional support. Teachers and staff in safe school environments support diversity, encourage communication between faculty and students, intervene in conflicts, and work to prevent teasing and bullying. Students in safe school climates feel empowered to share concerns with adults without shame or stigma. Education experts say schools can build a positive school climate by implementing the principles of PBIS, which stands for Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports. Representatives, the Ohio Department of Education and the University of Virginia's Dr. Cornell will explain more about PBIS and school climate in a moment. First, Dr. Lena Althari of the U.S. Secret Service says her organization has found examples of best practices, schools that are promoting safe school climates. And some of the things that we're seeing schools are doing are, are pretty creative. Uh, for example, doing a survey quarterly anonymous um, with students to find out what are the things that you find most challenging? Do you feel the school is supportive? Do you have a trusted adult in the school that you talk to? And if it's anonymous, then it's gonna, they're going to be more willing to report. And then doing the same thing with the staff at the school, because sometimes the perception of staff is that this is a great culture, students feel empowered, but if you'd assess the students, maybe that's not the case. So you want to make sure that you're kind of getting a pulse of what's going on in the school. That's step one. Uh, step two is making sure that you're looking at your disciplinary practices, for example, because one of the things that we've seen uh, students talk about in terms of not having a culture that's safe and sound at the school is maybe unfair disciplinary practice. Maybe there's a pecking order. Maybe they, uh, um, they feel like there's a popularity contest in terms of who gets disciplined, who does not. So I'm Emily Jordan. I work with the Department of Education in the Office of Integrated Student Supports. Um, and I work on mental health supports and behavior supports for students. And my work ties to threat assessment in the fact that we're trying to build um, cultures and climates where students feel supported. PBIS is Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports, and it helps create safe school environments because it creates the norms for a school. And so what schools do is they identify three to five behavior expectations that are the same throughout the entire school building. This way, all the students and all the staff know what are the expected behaviors in our building? And then staff take the time to teach those behavior expectations to students, giving them the skills they need to demonstrate the behaviors. Um, what that does is it creates stronger relationships between staff and students. It, it also helps when we have those norms that everyone feels a little bit calmer. We know what the behavior expectations are. We're all on the same page. Um, and we're teaching them the skills to be safe, to respect each other, to problem solve, everything that's needed to um, kind of eliminate some of the challenges that behaviors can have. What we typically um, use as our examples or what we see a lot for three to five behavior expectations are to be safe, be responsible, and be respectful. So those are some examples of what the three to five behavior expectations might look like. My name is Dr. Jill Jackson. I'm an education consultant at the Ohio Department of Education and the Office of Integrated Student Supports. And I'm responsible for the work in assisting Ohio schools with student supports. I think that um, the work that you all are doing very, is very important to ensure that law enforcement, school resource officers, building administrators, um, the positive behavior interventions and supports team or PBIS team, school counselors, school psychologists, other uh, school nurses and other professional staff in the building are working together. The idea of silos is quite an antiquated concept at this point and we know that we work better together and we ensure the safety of staff and students when we're aware of what student behaviors are earlier on we can share that information and work to provide interventions based on partnerships. It may be that once you share information that partners that you work with in the building would be able to support the students' needs to ensure the incidents um, remain low incident and don't escalate.
And then you all can um, stay in communication with each other about what's going on to ensure the student's behavioral needs do not escalate and that a safety matter is not imminent. And we need a climate in our schools where people understand the difference between snitching and seeking help. And so snitching something, is something you do for your own personal gain. Somebody else is going to be in trouble and you're going to gain from it. You're going to profit from it. Maybe you'll get some status or maybe you won't be punished. That's what snitching is. Uh, but on the other hand, if your motive is to stop somebody from being hurt uh, or stop somebody from hurting themselves, that's not snitching. That's seeking help. That's a critically important lesson. And when we look at, at, at threat, at school shootings that have been averted, we find that there were kids who knew the difference between snitching and seeking help, and they sought help. So threat reporting is, is critically important. But to really have threat reporting, we need a school climate where students feel uh, supported, cared about, and they also feel that the disciplinary consequences are strict but fair equitable. So in a zero tolerance climate where they feel like schools are going to put the hammer down for the most minor misbehavior, students don't want to report threats. Uh, I've seen cases where students called up an assistant principal in the middle of the night to say, I'm worried about something I saw on a chat line. Uh, they did that because they were in a school where they trusted the adults there. Uh, they trusted the adults and could reach out to them. Uh, the first school shooting that I evaluated, uh, a young man talked for quite some time about shooting up the school. And there were over a dozen kids who had either been threatened or warned, and not one of them went to an adult authority. Nobody told anybody, a parent, a teacher, the school resource officer. They didn't want to be a snitch. They didn't trust school authorities. Uh, and then that shooting took place. Uh, that really convinced me of the need for threat assessment. Uh, that is, if we had a climate in that school where students were willing to come forward, where they trusted the adults, then that shooting, I know, could have been prevented. And what you often find in the kids who plan school shootings or think about school shootings is alienation. They feel disrespected. They feel excluded. They feel like they have no place. Uh, and, uh, and so anything we can do to create a positive school climate, uh, as PBS strives to do, as restorative practices strive to do, uh, will lessen the risk of violence. The U.S. Secret Service says school administrators can help develop and sustain safe school climates by breaking down codes of silence and helping students feel more connected to the school and the people in it. We'll hear an example in which that kind of connection prevented very serious targeted violence in the Columbus, Ohio suburb of Hilliard. That story will be shared with us from Hilliard's school superintendent and police chief. First, we go to social worker Jamie Hardwick, who we've heard from previously. She describes the connections that are fostered in the Lima City Schools, where she works, thanks to safe spaces created in the schools there. Within our health center, so many students know it's a safe place. They know that they can come down there and that they're going to be taken care of. Whether they're having a medical emergency, a mental health emergency, we know that taking care of our physical health is just as important, but taking care of our mental health is even more important. And so knowing that they have a safe place to go and that what they share there is safe, and that they know that, okay, I know that I may share this and you may have to tell somebody, um, but I'm okay with that because I'm asking for the help. We had a young man who came in and said, I don't know what to do, but I'm going to hurt somebody. I have visions of killing my entire class. And he came from that class and he presented shaking and very upset and scared of himself and said, please help me. So those, those are creating those safe places. So whether it's your nurse's station that's safe, you know, whether it's banned, you know, so many, so many people have, are connected to these things that they're involved in. So in, ensuring that those staff are trained to recognize when somebody is having a mental health crisis. In 2016, we had a student at Davidson High School 
who was planning to do harm, who was planning to harm students in the school, had drawn up plans of the building, had started to recruit people to assist him in carrying out his plans, had gone as far as to know where to get ammunition and where to get weapons to carry this out. As he was talking on a bus to trying to recruit a student, someone else overheard. The student who overheard went and told their SRO. And one of the things that we pride ourselves in in Hilliard is our SROs are part of our staff. They engage with students all the time. They're in lunch, they're in the halls, they're talking to kids. So our students was comfortable enough to go to the SRO and say, this is what I overheard. That was it, that simple. When the police started looking into it, they found all of these troubling things that this student was doing. And as they investigated and they brought in the Joint Terrorism Task Force and the FBI, and as law enforcement from all these different levels came together, it was a credible threat that could have put us on the map as having a tragedy at one of our schools. One student listening, and for years we have told our kids, see something, say something. You have to build the culture and the relationships where they know who to say something to, and that when you get to the law enforcement level, they're able to act quickly. And so we averted what could have been a tragedy because of the culture we built and the partnerships that we have in place. Yeah, the key to uh, what I believe was a, a huge success for, for us, and, and quite frankly, uh, we, we averted a tragedy in that, uh, in that case, is that our school resource officers had established a fantastic relationship with the students that they work with. And our building staff and our school safety team, our administrators are all communicating and working together. And so when there was knowledge that a student had of uh, something that potentially could occur, they felt comfortable to say something after what they heard. And from that, we were able to develop an investigation and learn what potentially this student was planning to do and were able to intervene and resulted in, in a successful criminal prosecution. And uh, I think we saved a lot of lives by that interaction, that uh, relationship that really started with that student and that school resource officer. Another action that is suggested by the U.S. Secret Service to develop and sustain safe school climates is to help students identify clubs or teams at school they can join to feel more connected to the school. We'll have more on that in a moment from Arlington School Superintendent Joe Knoll in Stark County and one of his school resource officers. But first, keep in mind that students themselves have a role to play in sustaining safe school climates. They should be encouraged to reach out to classmates who may feel isolated. Hilliard Superintendent March Allison describes a unique program his district has adopted to do just that. We're working on the mental health approach with students. We have a director of student well-being. We have a director of social emotional learning. And we've brought in professionals on the clinician side. We have brought in licensed counselors to help with students who have challenges. Because anytime you're gonna look at these threats, one, you have to be preventative, but then can you also help with your students so that we don't get to that point? So as you look at what do you do to protect students in the event of the unthinkable, can you avoid the unthinkable? So we have hope squads where we have students who have trained, who we have trained to be listeners and friends throughout the district. So in a building like one of our three high schools, there are 50 kids who have been trained to identify students who may be reaching out for help. And they listen and they work with those students and then they direct those students to our resources. And one, of, I'll give you a specific example. Our Hope Squads last year, three different times, over a weekend identified a peer who is going to harm him or herself. We work with our local police and our Hope Squad students have been told to call the non-emergency number at the police department if they're concerned about one of their peers. Police sent fire and rescue over with police on a weekend night to these homes. All three of these children were admitted and kept at Children's Hospital for observation and counseling. These are a situation where three kids may have harmed themselves, 
but because of a partnership with the police, partnership with fire and rescue, and training our students what to look for in your peers when they're on Facebook, Instagram, social media, and it's two o'clock on a Friday night, our kids are trained to reach out to the law enforcement. Law enforcement has agreed to help with our kids and we're saving lives. And we're, when we're able to intercede before a student wants to harm themselves or harm others, now that's all part of us working together to keep our students safe. Well, what's big for me is making connections and relationships with kids. And at Marlington, I've called it heartening versus hardening. Hardening is the piece where you get a school resource officer and they carry a weapon and they have that presence. And I know you need those people. But to me, it's this heartening piece. If we're going to win the battle with mental health and dealing with all these other issues and um, trauma and grief, we got to connect the kids. And that's the heartening piece. And I'm big on that. I'll go to my grave believing if we're going to ever solve this problem, that's how we're going to do it. It's not going to be with an SRO, with a gun. Now, my SROs play a huge part in that heartening piece. You know, what can we do? What programs can we offer? What types of activities, clubs, whatever can we do to get every kid into something? And for us at Marlington, and I'm sure for my other colleagues as superintendents, it's huge. And we're spending a lot of time, effort, and money, to be honest with you, to bring those types of things to the forefront to help our kids get connected. It's about connections and relationships. It's plain and simple. I'll go back to my heartening versus hardening. We have worked so hard on that heartening piece to put things in place for our kids. So for example, in Marlington, we started a gamers club. All right, so after school, at the middle school and high school, they come in and play games. And that's all it is. My research officers are there to kind of monitor and be part of that conversation. But now we've connected to a group of kids that maybe aren't athletes or that don't play in the band or aren't on the student council. Um, we started a bowling team at Marlington, okay? 40 some kids show up right out of the blue. Kids that had never been in a sport before, now all of a sudden are in a sport, they wear their Marlington shirt and jacket with a little more pride. You know, like I said, th that's how I think we're going to win the battle with this whole mental health thing, uh, the school violence issue, is we got to find ways to connect. And to me, that's how you build a positive school climate, is by offering those types of opportunities for kids. My name is uh, Melissa Boganovich. I'm with the Star County Sheriff's Office. I've been a deputy there for 24 years. I've been in the schools for 20 years um, as SRO and DARE. I'm at Marlington Local Schools right now. Um, I'm currently serving on the threat assessment team. So I have created um, a gamers club. So it's after school program for those kids that aren't in band, that don't play football, that don't get to do any of those things. They come to that, but they like playing video games. So after school, like today, we have it on Wednesdays, 2:30 to 4, where they will come, they will sit, they will play video games, and you see a whole different side of those kids that you don't see during the day. You know, and the ones that sit by themselves at lunch, you know, now all of a sudden they're alive and they're engaging, and that's just huge for us. We've always had Gamers Club for the last five years of the middle school. Well, this year, we have all those kids going to high school and like, are we gonna have Gamers Club? Are we gonna have Gamers Club? So this year, we did get it at the high school and it was so nice because you see a kid that just has his head down, walking down, you know, and you say hello and he'll raise his eyes and say hi, but it makes you wonder, like, is he having a good day, bad day? But he came to Gamers Club and he just lit up and he's like, I didn't realize there were other kids like me and they're playing Dungeons and Dragons. And so that kind of, you know, warmed my heart like, hey, you know, this group is good for him. He's, he's belonging. There's a sense. And they've even asked, can we do this twice a week instead of once? So, you know, I know they're connecting and they feel like they're a part of something. So now that kid I see, and, and we've only been doing it for a month, but now he looks at me, he says, hello. He don't have his head straight down. He's like, hi, Deputy Boganovich, how are you? See you at Gamers Club. So to me, yes, I say absolutely. Making connections is huge. If you, if the kid resists you, there's a reason he's resisting you. So you need to just pry a little bit more, say hello. Hey, at lunch, hey, what's going on? You know, you, you need to connect. If they resist, you need to push a little harder. The kid is not connected is when they're going to feel like, I'm not loved, nobody cares about me, why am I here, I'm not important. So by doing the proactives of everything that I've just mentioned, you know, gamers club, get involved, talking to that student, make sure they're connected some way or another, is, is preventative. I mean, if you look at the other school shootings, the kids that did come in like Florida, he was suspended, but what if somebody would have just reached out and say, hey, what's going on with you? I know, you know, your dad passed, your mom passed, how are you, what, what can I do to help you? 
I'm not judging anybody, but I'm just saying it's just like a red flag to me because I think of those kids. When I look at the kids, like, you know, how can I meet, meet this kid's needs? It's all about meeting the kids' needs. And if you're not meeting that kid's needs, they're going to go somewhere else and get it. So, what, and it's a lot of work, it's a lot of energy, but they're worth it and you need to do it. So I, I truly think the proactive approach by having these gamers clubs or interacting with kids and just being there for them. Even though I have, I have a girl that, it's so funny, at the beginning of the school year last year, she was like, I'm not coming to school, I don't like you. She's in the principal's office yelling and screaming. I stood in front of the door, I said, you can yell and scream all you want, but you're not leaving and we're gonna talk. And she just, she, you know, she screamed and all of a sudden she sat down and cried. And she just, and then we had a great conversation and then she, you know, she, now, now she's my best friend. Now she's like, hi, Deputy Boganovich, anytime there's a problem, she'll come in, she'll sit and talk to me. And to me, like, you know, I made a breakthrough. If I want to take my stand with her and said, hey, no, we're going to talk. You can yell and scream all you want. You're not getting suspended. I'm not arresting you. We're going to talk. And then she just blew up, and then, you know, now she was fine. So I really think the proactiveness being that push, connecting with them whether they want it or not. Like I tell the teachers, don't back a kid in a corner. If they're acting up, there's a reason. There's a reason they're acting up figure out why, talk to them. And if you feel like there's something you can't get to them, go to someone else that can. Just don't push them aside and be like, you know what, I, I can't do anything with this kid. No, no, it's not okay. So, proactive, yes. You know, when I do a breakfast club um, at the middle school on Monday mornings, just for our kids, our seventh and eighth graders that just don't um, have a rough life, have a rough home life, or in foster care, whatever it may be. So they come, we make bacon and eggs, I have a pastor, Pastor Mike is great, and our family advocate person, Kathy Wybush, you know, we come in, we have 13 kids, they come in, they talk about their week, you know, how many kids want to come in, and it's like, oh, you know, I have no really, nobody really talked to how my weekend was, you know, what'd you do, what was, and, I, and my favorite thing is, you know, what was the best part of your weekend, what was the worst part of your weekend? And then we talk about the worst part of the weekend, and it just kind of helps them have a better week. Like a little girl, I've had her since elementary school, and she's very, I mean, she would sit in the corner, I'm not talking to you. And so now she gets to the middle school, and this year we're having a little problem with attendance. And she said to me on Monday, she goes, I wasn't going to come to school. I hate school, and I wasn't going to come. Then I remember it was breakfast club, and we were having bacon, so I got dressed. So, you know, so it does make a difference. It does, you know, just that little piece by giving, you give an inch, but you don't know how much, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take you. So I always say, you know, if I help one kid, that's all that matters. Up to this point, the examples of safe school climates that we've explored focused primarily on the students and the population inside the school. But the threat assessment team must bear in mind that threats to a school can come from someone outside of the school population. An example of a non-student who committed an act of violence against a school is Adam Lanza, the perpetrator involved in the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut in 2012. Events such as the Sandy Hook shooting show the importance of a threat assessment team investigating not just students, but anyone that may pose a threat to the safety of anyone at a school. Incidents of targeted violence involving adults are less common, but can be more serious because of an adult's greater ability to obtain materials needed to carry out the acts. Dr. Cornell at the University of Virginia cites these statistics from the state of Virginia. In the 2016-2017 academic year, public schools in that state reported 9,238 threat assessment cases. 98% of those involve students currently enrolled in the schools. The remaining cases involved 25 students from other schools, 24 former students, 50 parents, 44 current or former staff, and eight involved other adults associated with the school. Coming up next, step eight, conduct training for all stakeholders. <laughs>